I will present uh, Dr. Ovidio Moise, who is going to um, present um, a lecture on um, TEE for aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. I thought that would be good after this. And um, he is uh, an assistant professor at uh, uh, UT um, HVI. He did his uh, residency and fellowship there. Um, he went away briefly to be um, the chair of uh, UT Memorial West, uh, and now he is back uh, again uh, at HVI, and um, his uh, special interests um, include uh, aortic surgery, teaching, and he actually co-authored a book on uh, the practical, practical manual of CV anesthesia for residents. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. I think it's uh, movie time. <laughs> TE, so I don't want to go to too much theory. There's plenty of books. People explained it, I'm sure, nicer than I could. So we'll just watch some movies, and you're going to see much more of these as you go through the operating rooms in all three locations. Um, so let's see what we can do. Uh-huh. All right, so when we're talking about the valves and <coughs> uh, TE, uh, you must know how the normals look like to be able to assess if you, what you see is normal, abnormal, a normal version, or whatever the problem might be for that particular <coughs> case. So I just put here a static image of the normal valve with what you're actually looking at in the mid-esophageal short axis aortic valve view. Are we not getting the title for some reason? That's all right. So, and the next to it, you're going to see the. No, that's all right. So, next to it, you're going to see the uh, moving image for it. I'm not sure I didn't see the title. Short axis view again. You have the normal valve on the left, and you have the bicuspid in diastole and systole uh, on the right hand side just to see the difference between a normal valve with a normal three cusps as opposed to the bicuspid valve, only two cusps. Long axis view, same thing, aortic valve, still normal images. A bunch of things that you're going to see on each one of them. You're going to see the, the leaflets, you're going to see the LVOT, sinus of Valsalva, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta, right ventricle somewhere down here, and then mitral valve, a little bit of mitral valve, left atrium and left ventricle down here. All right. Excellent. Long axis view of the aortic valve. That's how it should be looking normally, reasonably normally. Difficult to encounter normal images in the operating room. Am I not pushing the right thing? Uh-huh. No. <laughs> I just use the, the... The arrows? Yeah, the arrows. That's what I'm doing, too. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so major causes of aortic stenosis is probably the, one of the three slides that I have with text. Calcific, bicuspid valve, rheumatic, differs from the calcific just because you can get uh, thickening of edges and commissural fusion on top of possible calcifications, and then, of course, iatrogenic. Okay. See if we can get this one moving, too. Excellent. Short axis, aortic valve, mean esophageal. You have a stenotic valve. You can see the three cusps not quite opening properly. It may be associated with uh, aortic regurgitation or not. You can see the colored Doppler flow uh, on this side and the non-colored Doppler flow on the other side. Clearly calcified, thickened, not opening, not closing properly. <laughs> Sorry. 
Nine. I'm glad I gave you this. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> I'm probably going to give it a little bit more time in between my clicks and wait. Maybe it moves. I'm trying to advance to the next slide, and uh, the arrows don't do it. The slide bar doesn't do it. All right, long axis aortic valve. Same thing, aortic stenosis. You're going to see, see the leaflets on this side opening less well than previously than the normal one. It is associated in this particular image with some aortic regurgitation. All right, next slide. See if it works like this. Aha. Uh -huh. Oops, too much. One back. All right, mitral valve. I'll go this really quick. Mitral valve, much more complex anatomy than the aortic valve. I got these slides from somebody else. They're not mine. They look nice. I thought they, they explained perfectly what they need to do. So depending on um, where you look on the mitral valve from and how you position your probe, your transesophageal echo probe, you're going to look, be looking at different things. So if you look at the top right in the anatomical orientation of the mitral valve, you usually start looking straight in the middle and then rotating your probe a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. You'll be looking at different areas of the mitral valve. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you see the T orientation, which is different in anatomical, obviously. The anatomical corresponds to the surgical view also. They like to see smiley faces, faces so they see smiley faces in the mitral valve. And then the anatomy of the mitral valve is also much more complex. The aortic valve is basically an in-plane valve tri-leaflet. The mitral valve looks much more like a saddle. So it's, that's why, what's one of the reasons it's much more difficult to replace through a transcatheter technique, at least up to these days. But it's a much more complex anatomy. You're looking at completely different areas of co-optation depending on how you look at it. Next slide. All right, mechanism of mitral regurgitation. Main mechanism of mitral regurgitation can be myxomative degeneration, it can be a ventricular dysfunction issue with papillary muscle, muscle dysfunction, it can be a papillary muscle rupture, it can be endocarditis with vegetations or holes, it can be rheumatic or it can be iatrogenic. Let's see what I can show you. Next slide. All right. Just to clarify, what's the difference between a prolapse and a flail segment? Because I get that question a lot. The normal on the left, you have the types of corda tendine. The prolapse means a part of the valve goes above the um, annulus plane. A flail segment means a piece of the edge of the valve, including uh, corda tendine, is going completely above the annular plane. Next slide. All right. Okay. Quick time not available. All right, so you would see a mitral regurgitation jet on this side, and you would see a severe mitral regurgitation jet on the other side. I'm not sure why they're not playing. Let's move on to the next slide. All right. As far as the mechanism of mitral regurgitation, this one is an A2 prolapse. It's a um, commissural view of the mitral valve, mid-esophageal commissural view. You're going to look at P1, A2, and P, P3 on this side. You see a piece of the mitral valve coming up behind here. That's an A2 prolapse. Next slide. A P3 flail this time. Remember the difference between flail and prolapse? You have a piece of the, mitre, of the edge of the mitral leaflet, including a corda tendine going above the annular plane. You're looking at a long axis view of the mitral valve here at around 120, 130 degrees. Uh, you're looking at the anterior mitral valve leaflet here, the posterior mitral valve leaflet here. This is a P3 prolapse right there. 
Next slide. All right, the P1 flailed. Basically the same image, a different patient, obviously. Uh, you're looking at, this is a four chamber view. You're looking at the anterior mitral leaflet on this side, posterior mitral leaflet on that side. You see the piece of the posterior leaflet flailing into the uh, left atrium, or the, again, with the little broken, broken corded tendina right there. Next slide. This is an interesting, one of the interesting situations where it's fairly, which is fairly difficult to diagnose sometimes. You're looking at a hole in the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Uh, this is probably in a two-chamber view of the uh, mitral valve mini-esophageal position. Um, the patient has my, says mitral regurgitation, obviously. You can see the hole right there in and out of view, and you can see the jet through the hole right here. And then, of course, there's that some degree of mitral regurgitation coming through the co-optation plane, normal co-optation plane, but that's one of the issues this patient had endocarditis. Next slide. All right, iatrogenic. People get mitral valve replacements all the time. Uh, mechanical valves are supposed to be on anticoagulation, lifetime anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is sometimes very difficult to be achieved on an outpatient basis. Some patients are more compliant than others. This one um, wasn't. So you can see the mechanical valve moving right here in the middle. You can see a nice big clot blocking one of the leaflets right here and there's another smaller clot if you notice it right there causing mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis for that matter. There's the regurgitant jet. Next slide. Next slide. Next. Yes, all right, so anybody can tell this is a severe mitral regurgitation situation. Um, I haven't seen many that bad <laughs> causing, um, I mean, going around the atrium, I'm not sure exactly where the blood, if the blood ever goes into the ventricle at this point. I mean, yeah, it just goes around and around and stays there. And uh, the last image that I'm gonna show you is another iatrogenic cause of mitral regurgitation. If we can go to the next slide. Excellent. So this patient had a very interesting uh, situation. Had a, uh, does it play? Oops, no, no, back, back. One more. I'm not touching it. <laughs> yeah. Does it play? It is the right slide. Yes, please. So, the patient had uh, a very calcific mitral valve annulus that was deemed inoperable at some point. Um, the surgeon decided it's impossible for him to place uh, the needed stay sutures for a mitral valve replacement. So he elected to do a transcatheter sapien valve in mitral position through a minimally invasive technique. <laughs> um, it worked fine for about 14 hours. He did place three stay sutures after all, despite the calcifications. After 14 hours, this is how the patient came back, the mitral well, the sapien valve, I should say, um, decided to not cooperate. Two of the stay sutures were broken. One of them held somehow, and you can see, can we play it one more time, please? Uh, you can see it on the left side, the non-color Doppler one flailing into the previous, flailing into the left atrium in and out with every contraction, and of course, this will cause some mitral regurgitation. All right, last slide, next one, the one with the questions. And I believe we'll 
take questions at the end. All right, so this is, this is it for me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>